Everywhere you look, there it is. Think psychiatry has nothing to do with you? Think again. The whole field of psychiatry has gotten into every facet of your life. They basically believe that everyone is mentally ill. You smoke too much, it's a disease. You are too unhappy, it's a disease. You are too thin, it's a disease. You are too fat, it's a disease. Where are these coming from? These are coming from the minds of psychiatrists that are dreaming these things up, writing papers and, get, and getting published with their names on it, calling, creating these new diseases. First he said that I had ADD. Then he said that I was depressed. Then he said I might be bipolar, but I don't have ADD anymore. And he said, you know, I've been noticing you and I, I wonder if you have it too. What they decided is that both my husband and my son had a chemical imbalance that needed to be corrected with a chemical balancer. There is not one shred of credible evidence that any respectable scientist would consider valid demonstrating that anything that psychiatrists call mental illness are brain diseases or biochemical imbalances. It's all fraud. There is no reliability of diagnosis and there is no science. It's just pseudoscience. It's pretend science. This is one of the most open secrets in all of America in the psychiatric field that nothing, nothing is being done this legitimate and they're billing for it. Psychiatrists claim that over one billion of the world's population is mentally ill. In the past 30 years, they have prescribed psychiatric medications to 543 million people. And right now, they drug 17 million school children with stimulants and antidepressants. When recently asked about the scientific basis of yeah, their profession, those psychiatrists willing to be interviewed I have offered no nothing but excuses. Psychiatric uh, illness is, uh, is not really an uh, illness. How do you uh, evaluate if someone is cured or, or sick? Cure is certainly something we look forward to and we had no earthly idea how to accomplish. We're not good at the causes. We don't know what causes mental illness. But that hasn't stopped them from pronouncing themselves mental health experts and treating people against their will. And the results? This psychiatrist, man who's supposed to work to heal people, has done nothing but destroy this man's life and in destroying his life, destroying the lives of all of his loved ones. Excuse me. They've damaged and ruined my son and they've trapped him in a system. The way that they treated him and made him feel like he was worthless. Riot was being kept dumb and, and high on Ritalin so that they could make $2,500 per month. He gave me Valium and um, I got addicted to it. It wiped out my life. My life has been ruined. Uh, my joy has been stolen. She was lying in there. She took two two gasps of air and died right there in front of me. It is really tragic. It's awful. And it's being done for money. That's why it's being done. Oh, it's got to be in the billions. I don't know the exact number, but it's got to be in the billions. It's, it's just unbelievable. This is so big that it's, it buckles the mind. Take the human tragedy you have just seen and multiply it by the millions. In the past four decades, nearly twice as many Americans have died in government psychiatric hospitals than in all U.S. wars since 1776. Insurance companies pay out $69 billion every year for psychiatric services, doubling the cost of medical insurance premiums. And while raking in over $2 trillion annually, psychiatrists cannot point to a single cure. Hard to believe? That's exactly what they count on. And as we will show you, it's how they have been getting away with it from the very beginning. psychiatry have to do with control, power, and alienation from certain groups of people who are uncomfortable to be around. 
They were locked up in these places to get them out of the way. Uh, the history of psychiatry, I think, really is related to institutions. Bethlehem Royal Hospital in London was one of the world's first psychiatric institutions. Commonly referred to as Bedlam, the hospital was little more than a warehouse for those deemed mad. Inmates were confined to cages, closets, and animal stalls, chained to walls, and flogged, while the asylum charged admission for public viewings. In the 18th century, William Batty was the first to promote that his institutions could cure the mentally ill. Batty's madhouses made him one of the richest men in England, though his treatments were every bit as inhumane as those practiced in Bedlam, with not a single patient cured. His financial success triggered a boom in the asylum business and an opportunity for psychiatrists to cash in on this new growth industry. This was an era where, on both sides of the Atlantic, specialized institutions for the mentally ill are beginning to be built in large numbers. Those institutions date back certainly to the beginning of the 18th century, and in a few cases even earlier than that. Uh, but the explosive growth of an asylum sector, of asylumdom as some historians have called it, is very much a, a 19th century phenomenon. Uh, it's that period when the state is persuaded to invest tax dollars in building these places. But while those who ran the institutions were getting rich, psychiatrists yet lacked the credibility to maximize their cash flow. In order to justify their profession, they needed to come up with these biological solutions, or they didn't, didn't have any profession. The only way for them to solve that was to attempt to start uh, believing that, that these people that were suffering from emotional disorders was from, from a biological basis. Whatever was done to make this person more manageable would be simply called a treatment. And the sad reality is that many of these so-called treatments were in essence torture. The near drowning devices that were developed in this period, for example, must have been appallingly frightening. For example, one device involved putting the patient into a coffin, closing the lid and dumping it into a bath of water, and then opening it up and trying to revive the patient. There were a range of these things, and the mortality rate was, was very, very high. Psychiatrists next sought to give credence to their practices by cloaking them in the language of medicine. This repackaging of treatment became known as the medical model. Somebody who is really hyper and manic, uh, if you're wrapped up in a cold sheet and dunked into some water, you're going to quit acting manic because that's a punishing uh, treatment. So, but as soon as the symptoms started to go away, they started to believe that somehow by wrapping them up and dunking them in cold water, it was um, draining the toxics out of their body. So they built the medical model around that. Pushing the biological theory of mental illness a step further, an American, Benjamin Rush, put forth the idea that insanity was caused by too much blood in the head. The cure? Remove the blood by any means possible restraint, cold water, bleeding, even terror. And with that, a new medical model was created. Benjamin Rush was probably the most famous American physician of the revolutionary era. Uh, Rush was known as the master bleeder. He bled his patients for madness. He also invented something called the tranquilizer. It's a chair that looks a little bit like an electric chair. The patient was confined in this apparatus, uh, sometimes with cold water applied to his or her head, for some hours at a time, and Rush announces in a letter that he's invented this new contraption and dubbed it the tranquilizer. Rush's often lethal procedures were detailed in his 1812 textbook, which remained psychiatry's authoritative source for the next 70 years. He was so revered that in 1965, Rush was enshrined as the father of American psychiatry on the seal of the American Psychiatric Association. As the 1800s wore on, psychiatry's mounting failures at curing madness threatened their financial bottom line. 
forcing them to invent new medical models. The cures promised when it was delivered. So by the 1860s and 70s, a growing mood of pessimism was covering Europe and North America, that effectively the new institutions were ever growing in size, but not growing in their effectiveness. The 20th century brought more medical models. American psychiatrist Henry Cotton mutilated his patients by removing their body parts, declaring this a breakthrough in the treatment of mental illness. The earliest target was the teeth and then the tonsils and the sinuses, but when patients didn't get better, the enthusiasts for this treatment then started to move down the body and to say, well, obviously patients have swallowed um, bacteria in their saliva, so stomachs need to go, spleens need to go, uh, colons need to go. As public outcry escalated over torture and maiming of patients, psychiatrists would invent new methods, each one hailed as the miracle cure. But each one was ultimately proven no more effective nor less brutal than the last. This is a history of psychiatry, more or less, to, to damage the patient. I mean, this is a version of the original model, which was to chain them like animals. If you're doing it to somebody because you insist that they have to change, and you're going to do that by turning the screws, you might say, whether it's with medication, restraint, whatever, that's torture. And a huge part of what psychiatry has done really comes down to torture. As the 20th century progressed, psychiatry would continue to seek legitimacy by transforming itself into a medical discipline. But they succeeded only in creating more efficient ways of inflicting mental and physical torture and death. A legacy that has carried forward into modern psychiatry with its most profitable medical model to date, the mass drugging of millions. But to do this, psychiatrists first had to shatter one of mankind's most cherished beliefs, decreeing that people were not what they thought they were. Leipzig University, Germany, 1879. Professor Wilhelm Wundt experiments on the human senses. Wundt declares man's thoughts, personality, and behavior are nothing more than chemical reactions in the brain. Wundt uh, became frustrated with his inability to change behavior because he was dealing with the original, you know, psychology. That's the psyche, that's the soul. He created a new science which was based on man being an animal without a soul to be trained. Not to be a thinker, but to be trained. Students from around the world gathered to study Wundt's new definition of man as a soulless organism. The spirit of the age was summed up by German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. Gott is tot. Gott bleibt tot. Following Wundt's theory, a Russian, Ivan Pavlov, conducted animal experiments seeking methods to modify behavior. Pavlov studied in Wilhelm Wundt's laboratory in Leipzig, Germany, in the late 1800s. And he experimented with uh, dogs, you know, with electrodes and, and stimulus response, denying uh, privileges to denying rewards. And he noticed that when you brought out some food in front of animals, dogs in particular, that they would begin to salivate. So he'd ring the bell at the same time that he brought the food out, and then eventually, instead of bringing the food out, he just rang the bell, and of course the, the dogs got all excited. He called that a conditioned reflex. Pavlov's first human subjects were children. He punched holes in their cheeks to collect and measure their saliva. Pavlovian conditioning became one of the major foundations of a lot of behavioral science research in the 20th century. The idea that behavior could be controlled through repetitive conditioning became known as behaviorism. The behaviorists believe that all children are animals and can be trained as animals. This was the view of, 
of behavior